Okay. Okay. So let's continue. Okay. So I think so far we have discussed several instantiations of PD, right? Like so. We looked at an on policy SARSA and an off policy Q learning. And we also looked at expected SARSA, which can be both on policy and off policy, depending on how you uh, how you set up things, right? So now let's talk about <coughs> some of the problems with uh, this kind of PD update uh, in general and, and how to resolve them and, and also some improvements to the basic idea, okay? So first, what we are going to talk about is about the problem of maximization bias. Okay? So all the control algorithms that we have seen so far, like PD and Monte Carlo, okay? So in some sense, they all involve some max equation somewhere, right? Like, so for example, in the case of Q learning. You have a target policy, which is basically greedy, right? Which means you're taking a max over your estimated Q values. Now, in the case of SARSA, you have an epsilon greedy policy, right? Which also has a max over all the estimated Q values, okay? Now, this is something nobody asked me before, uh, but it's kind of also related to the question about like why the errors were going up a little bit, right? So now we are taking a maximum over estimated values, okay? Um, which is kind of an estimate of the maximum value, right? Things could go wrong. And we could have a significant positive bias because we are taking max over a bunch of like values which are already estimates, right? Like, so we don't know if these estimates are correct estimates. You have some rough estimates of the Q values and you're taking a max over that. On, but in reality, you wanted to take max over the true like action values, right? Like in some sense, this is an estimate of the max itself, right? So now this could lead to positive bias. Okay, now I can give you a couple of examples. So for example, let's just consider a single state, yes. Okay, where the true Q value for all the actions is zero. Okay, so Q of S comma A is equal to zero. But we are trying to estimate this with capital Q, okay. Now when we are estimating, we can never reach the true value. So we are going to have some approximation, right? Now because the Q value is zero, my approximations are going to be either below zero or above zero for some actions. Let's say I have 10 actions. For some actions, it's going to be below zero. And for some actions, it's going to be above zero. Now, I'm taking a max over all these estimates, which means I'm going to prefer this action, which has positive Q value over all the other actions. However, in reality, all actions should be treated equally, right? So, so you have this kind of positive bias or maximization bias. Okay, now this bias could be problematic. This could lead to overestimations. Okay, now these overestimations have a very deep impact because you're bootstrapping. If you are not bootstrapping, then probably these overestimates are not going to affect that much. Better. But you're bootstrapping here, which means this esti overestimations are going to get bootstrapped to other states. And like you are going to do a lot of overestimations and your Q values might go up. Okay, so here is a practical example. Okay, so this is a very simple, like two state world. I have only two states, A and B. Okay, now at A, you can either go left or right. If you go right, you get a reward of zero and terminate. If you go left, you reach state B. Okay, from state B, all your actions takes to terminal, but with a reward 
which is a normal distribution centered at minus 0 0.1. Okay. Now, what should be the optimal action here? Sorry? From A or B? From A. Go to B. Sorry? Go right. Go right. Any other answers? Go to B. Go to B. Why? Because from A to B, you are getting a reward, and then by going to terminal state, also we have something. Oh, A to B, you don't get a reward, it's zero. Yeah. Go right. Okay, so a lot of you think it's go right. So, what about people in chat? From A, should I go right or left? Right. Okay. A lot of rights. Okay. Okay. So in this case, the, the, the optimal action is to go right. Okay. Because you get a reward of zero and you terminate. On the other hand, if you go left, you can get really negative rewards. Right. So now let's see what Q learning will do here. Right. So in this, in this graph, you see as the number of episodes increases, the percentage of times Q learning took left action. Okay. You can see that initially the percentage actually increases because it saw this one positive reward. Like, so with the zero point minus zero point one center and a variance of one, very rarely once in a while you could get a positive reward, right? So it saw one positive reward, it picked up on that positive reward, and it started developing this bias towards going to left side. Okay. However, as you see B more and more often, you're going to see a lot of negative rewards. Then it actually goes down and eventually it it learns to not go too much to uh, to the B side. Is that clear? Now, this is the maximization bias problem that we are talking about. Okay. Now, how do I avoid this problem? We know that there is a problem with this kind of estimates. How do I avoid maximization bias? Any suggestions? Any suggestions? And the question, yeah, why is the optimal at the five percent? Uh, oh, that's because of the epsilon greedy. Okay. In this case, are your epsilon? Can you guess the epsilon? 10 percent, yeah. How to avoid this maximization bias? Any thoughts? So the problem is clear. The problem is I'm taking max over a bunch of things which I'm not very certain about, which could exaggerate the estimate. So how do I avoid this? OK, well, I have a solution. So to discuss the solution, first let's go back to bandit setting. Okay, It's just easier to talk about in bandit setting, and then we're going to come back to MDP. OK, let's consider a bandit, bandit setting, like where you have a bunch of actions. You're just estimating the Q values of this action. Simple, right? Like no, no next state, uh, no return. It is just immediate reward. OK, now, how about I divide my trials, like the number of episodes, into two sets? Okay, I'm going to use the, let's say there are 100 trials with my bandit. I'm going to use half of the trials to estimate Q1 of A and other half to estimate Q2 of A. These are two estimates for the same action. Okay, and they are both trying to estimate the true value. Okay, however, they are two independent estimates. Okay, now I can use Q1 for computing the max function. Okay, so I, I will have my A star is equal to R max over A Q1 of A. Is that clear? Fine. Now I can use, I take the R max, we are using Q1. Okay, 
Now the problem is, I'm trusting that this argmax value is correct, right? If that argmax value is wrong, then there is a bias. To remove that bias, I am not going to trust Q1 for the value. I'm going to use Q1 only to choose the action, and I'm going to compute the value using the estimate from Q2. Use Q2 for the estimate. So I'm just going to consider what is Q2 of A star, or in other words, what is Q2 of R max of A, Q1 of A. Okay. Now, this estimate is going to be an unbiased estimate. Why? Because we know that the expected value of Q2 of A star is nothing but Q of A star. Right? So in some sense, we are reducing this maximization bias by having two Q values, one to compute the max and the other one to say the value. They are independent. So, so the max cannot influence the other one and vice versa, right? Like so now there is no reason why this should be this. Q1 for max and Q2 for value. It could be the opposite as well. Like, so for example, I could have org max from Q2, right? And then you compute, use Q1 for value estimate, right? Now you can do both together, okay? So that is the idea behind double learning, okay? So in double learning, they are going to have two different estimates. And in every episode, you randomly assign one of them to be the max, to one of them for max, one of them for value. Okay, you can switch this like every episode. Okay, now in this case, it is going to double the memory requirements because you are going to keep two Q values. However, the computation is exactly same because you are you're either going to do this or this. You can pick whatever you want to do, okay? So, is this clear? Now, this idea can be easily extended to the MDP setting, okay? So, you can extend this double, double learning idea to SARSA or Q learning or expected SARSA, whatever, okay? But just for an example, in this lecture, like we are going to see. <coughs> One second. Okay. So in this example, like in this lecture, we are going to see double Q learning, which is one of the famous algorithms, okay? So the idea in double Q learning is you're going to have two different estimates, Q1 and Q2. The update is going to look something like this. So Q1 of ST comma AT is equal to Q1 of ST comma AT plus alpha times RT plus one plus gamma of Look at this, Q2 of ST plus one comma R max over Q1 of ST plus one comma A minus Q1 of ST comma A. Okay, so what did I do here? Like, so I'm doing R max, I'm doing R max with Q1, okay? However, I'm, up, I'm, I'm using the value from Q2, is that clear? Now, you can actually have the reverse of this equation. Like you can do this for Q2. Like you can, you can do Q2 is equal to Q2 plus alpha times RT plus one plus gamma of Q1 times max of Q2, right? Like so you can have a coin flip in every episode. You decide what is Q1, what is Q2, okay? Now, your behavior policy can actually use both the action values to make. When you take actions, you can take an average of these two Q values and find and use that to take the action. Okay, is that clear? So this is how the double Q learning will look like. It looks very much like Q learning, except you have two, sorry, you have two Q functions and your behavior policy is sum of these two. So you can also take average of these two, it doesn't matter. And every time you update either Q1 or Q2. Is that clear? Now let's see how double Q learning will look like in like work like, 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 like perform in the same two state problem. Okay, so, so here is this two state problem where we are comparing Q learning versus double Q learning. You can see that double Q learning does not have the maximization bias. 
it it starts with some high percentage for action A. I think it's 50-50. It start every, everybody starts with 50, right? So, like, but it it, uh, it actually figures out that uh, A is optimal very quickly. Is that clear? Any questions? Yeah. Um, algorithm is clear, but can you explain again the intuition and double queue again? Okay, so then solve this problem. Okay. Well, first of all, when I say solve this problem, I think it's kind of a strong statement. Like, so it's going to reduce the effect of uh, maximization bias. Okay, there's no guarantee that the bias is going to go away, right? So it's going to reduce the maximization bias. So why is it going to reduce? Because I am not using the same function to compute both max and the value. Because value itself is might might be wrong, right? Because the value is kind of an estimate. Now you don't want to trust the same value and get same value and the max from the same two functions. So by separating out these two things, you're reducing the chance that you are getting into this positive bias. Now you are getting max for another estimate, right? So. Yes, but there's no, in, there's no dependence here. Like they're independent. So that should hopefully reduce the bias. See, let me tell you one thing. Like, so in this case, right? Where is the, hmm, maybe let's go here. So in this case, right? I'm taking max with respect to Q1, but with respect to Q2, that might not be the max. With respect to Q2, it might be the second or third best option, okay? Now, you see the benefit, right? Like, so you are considering even non-max actions of Q1 which is a good thing to do because you don't trust the max of Q1. Okay, okay. so, okay, that's double Q learning. So now we are going to talk about, yeah. So does it mean that we have the Q value of the next state in both, for both Q1 and Q2 always? Because with probability, we are going to update only one Q. So the next time when we... So you, you still have some estimates from the past, right? So for both Q1 and Q2. So you have access to both Q1 and Q2. Okay. So now we have seen two learning algorithms, right? Like, so like the first learning algorithm was Monte I'm not going to consider DP as a learning algorithm, okay? Because in, that D, in DP, you don't really interact. The world is given to you. But in the case of other two classes, that you're learning. So in one side, you have Monte Carlo, which is learning by rolling out the entire episode, right? So you start from, now we are talking about actions, right? So let's draw the action diagrams. So you start, like you're, you, have, you have something like this. Hmm. Probably take an action and then you end. Okay. And in the other extreme, we have TD methods where you take an action and then, like, this is one step, right? So now one can think about combinations of these two, right? Like, so, like, can I have an algorithm which instead of just being in one of these two extremes, have the best of both in the sense, instead of just doing one step ahead and then computing my update equation like TD, can I move a few more steps, right? Like, so, so that is the idea behind n step bootstrapping, okay? So between TD and, M and MC, we have, a we have a whole family of algorithms, okay? So which are going to have different levels of bootstrapping, okay? So we're going to call them as n-step bootstrapping algorithm, okay? Now to differentiate this from the TD that we have seen so far, from now on, we are going to call the TD algorithm that we have seen so far as one-step TD. Is it clear? So now n-step TD, kind of generalizes both Monte Carlo and one step TD. Okay, so here is the problem with one step TD, right? Like, so it's not very optimal algorithm in the sense, you start with, in, in, in one step TD, like you take an action in every time step, 
but you also bootstrap in every time step, right? Now, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. You might be in an application where you have to take action quickly, but the states change significantly for every five, every five seconds or 10 seconds or 20 seconds, okay? <clears throat> so maybe there is no need to bootstrap in this time step. Like, can I have this flexibility to bootstrap whenever I want instead of in every time step, right? So, or in other words, we, there are two factors, the two notions of time here. So time to take action, time to bootstrap. So time to take action is not in your control. Like, so like it is, it is given by the environment. Like, so if you're a robot moving, like you have to take action, otherwise you're staying still, right? So, and if you are controlling a power plant, then you have to always maintain the temperature and, and the quantity of acids and so on, right? Like, so, so time to take action is something out of your control, but time to bootstrap is totally in your control. Like, so you don't need to bootstrap immediately. At the same time, you don't need to wait till the end, like Monte Carlo. So you can do something in between, okay? So that is what we're going to see now. So we're going to talk about, well, as usual, first let's talk about um, end step theory prediction. Okay, now, so here is how different end step methods will look like, but this is for state value estimation. So in this extreme, you have one step TD, okay? So one step TD from the current state, it takes an action, goes to the next state and updates, right? And in this case, you have Monte Carlo, which can also be treated as infinite step TD because you go all the way to the end of the episode. Then you are taking a TD update. It just so happens that the TD update is really the actual return. But in between, you have a lot of interesting algorithms. Like, so here is two step TD, okay? So two step TD, will take first action, second action, which means you get two rewards. For rest of the rewards, you're going to estimate it, like you're going to approximate it by using this, your value function. Is that clear? Now, three steps TD is going to row, unroll for three steps and then make the approximation. If you unroll all the steps, then there is no approximation that is Monte Carlo. Is that clear? Now these, now these instep methods are still TD methods because they are still having some estimate of the future state in, in the picture, okay? So now let's look at how these algorithms would look like in terms of update equations, okay? Now imagine you are in state ST, okay? And you receive some action RT plus one, and then you go to next state. I'm, I'm not in, including actions here okay, because they're not relevant. So ST plus one, you'd make some action and you get an RT plus two. Finally, you get a terminal reward and reach a terminal state and stop. Okay. Now, in terms of Monte Carlo, your GT is defined as RT plus one plus gamma times RT plus two plus gamma square times RT plus three plus gamma T minus T minus one times R right? So this is my return or the target for the update in Monte Carlo. Now, can someone tell me what is the target for one step TD? Yeah, what is that? RT plus one plus gamma times? The value, of value of the next state, right? So it's V of ST plus one, okay? Now we are going to call this as GT from T plus one. It's called GT from T plus one because up to T plus one, it is accurate. It is, it is what the actual return is. But after T plus one, okay, so we have this estimate. So you can consider this as a truncated return where I truncate at some point, in this case, one time step, and then I approximate the rest with the value function, okay? If you think about it this way, in truncated fashion, now I can truncate wherever I want, right? So I can have a two-step TD, whose update is going to be something like RT plus one, plus gamma times RT plus two, okay? Plus gamma square times 
bt plus 1 of st plus 2. Okay. Now I can generalize this to n step TD. So I can have an n step TD algorithm. Okay. So in the case of n step TD, my GT from T to T plus M is given by RT plus 1 plus gamma times RT plus 2 plus finally gamma n minus 1 time RT plus N plus gamma n times v of st plus n. Is that clear? Now when I do n step return, let's say I do a five step return and I am in the last state or the second last state, then I don't have five more states to go, right? So then for the rest, you are going to assume zero return. <coughs> okay. So for any t plus n which is greater than or equal to my episode length, all the missing entries are just treated as zero. Is that clear? Yeah. What are subscripts of v? Oh, subscripts. Don't worry about subscripts because subscripts are what was the value estimate at that time step? Because when you are in t plus okay, okay. So if you think about if you think about this. Update equation. Okay. You cannot make this update until you have seen ST plus 2. Right? So you are in ST. You take the next state. You go to the next state, ST plus 1. Then you go to the next state, ST plus 2. So that is when you can make this update. So by the time you are in that state, your value estimates are from the state before that, right? Like it's just basically VT plus 1. Is that clear? But really don't worry about the subscripts of V. So in practice, when you implement this, it is always the V that you're storing. So like the time timestamp doesn't matter. Okay. So now if you want to use this to construct an end step update rule, it's going to look something like this. So V T plus N of S T is going to be V T plus N minus one of S T. Okay. Plus alpha times g t to t plus n okay minus v t plus n minus 1 of st is that clear i think uh, the screen went off so well it will come back in 10 seconds <coughs> Hmm. Okay, while we are waiting for the screen, there is a question in the chat. Um, interesting questions like so, how can we pick n value and can we change the n value in between? Okay, so, but probably it's easier to answer once I show you an example. Okay, we're going to talk about it. So, okay, so the, the screen was solved. Okay, so this is the update equation. Okay, so we, the value function is approximated like in normal Monte Carlo, this is going to be the complete return. In TD, one step TD, this is going to be RT plus alpha times VT, VST plus one. But for n step TD, it's going to be this complex stuff. Is that clear? Now, here is how the algorithm is going to look like. Okay. Let us not spend too much time in understanding the algorithm. You can go back and read uh, at your uh, own speed. Uh, but what it is really trying to do is to compute uh, these n step returns in a clever way like when you go back and then like uh, it is going to update based on that. Okay. So the whole point of the algorithm is to estimate this. Sorry, I thought I have a highlighter. The whole point of the algorithm is to estimate the correct way to do this G. Is that clear? So now let us see how this algorithm will work. So here we are going to consider this five state MRP that we decided what before, right? Like so uh, now just to show the value of increasing the value of n, we are going to replace this five state problem with 19 state problem. Okay. There's going to be 19 states. You start in the middle and you go to either left or right. Okay. Now it's going to be slightly different. Well, 
instead of having positive one in the right side, you are going to have negative one in the left side. Okay, and all the values initialized to zero. Now you can see the RMS value of different n step methods. So this n is equal to one. Sorry, this n is equal to one that you are seeing is one step t. Okay, so then this is two step t d. This is four step, eight step, sixteen, and so on. Okay, so now you can see that. The first observation here is n is equal to one is definitely not the optimal thing to do, right? Okay, so the x-axis is different values of alpha. Okay, so basically, like an algorithm is best if it has lowest point. So, for example, in this case, I think n is equal to four is the best value because it achieves the lowest RMS. Okay, now you can see that n is equal to one is not optimal. At the same time, very high n is also not optimal. Okay. So, as you could have guessed before, this value of n step, right, is actually a hyperparameter. You have to pick one of the n. Okay. Now, you can actually consider all possible n's when you are doing the update. Okay. But probably we will talk about such an such a complex algorithm after four or five weeks towards the end of the course okay so so it is possible to consider simultaneously all possible ends but we are not going to do that right now so for now we will pick an end like even for even when you try out these things in your assignments like you'll just pick an end or try different ends and see what happens is that clear now now that we have seen prediction now we can go back to our control setting like so for example like first question is how to do on policy end step Methods, right? Like so, we can talk about the n-step SARSA. Okay, so for n-step SARSA, you have the return g t to t plus n, which is r t plus one, plus gamma times r t plus two, plus gamma n minus one times r t plus n, plus gamma power n, q value of s t plus n, k t plus n. Right now, this g t to t plus n is going to be exactly g t if t plus n is greater than or equal to capital T. So, if you are towards the end of that episode, when you have only four more steps to go, if you are doing five step return, then it is already the true return. Okay, sometimes it's going to be true return. Now, you can do SARSA update here, like which is basically the same SARSA update. It is just that the target is going to be different. So QT plus N of STAT is going to be QT plus N minus one of STAT plus alpha times G, okay, minus Q of STAT. Is that clear? Now here is how the backup diagram for SARSA would look like. Okay, so in the left side. You have one step SARSA, right? The normal one. Now you can think about two steps SARSA, three steps SARSA, n steps SARSA. So this is infinite steps SARSA, which is basically Monte Carlo. Is that clear? Okay. So now that okay, maybe let's look at this algorithm first before we talk about expected SARSA. Okay. So here is the algorithm. So, well, as you can imagine, as we progress in the course, like the algorithm, the final algorithm is always going to be looking a little bit more complicated. Okay, so we will not spend too much time in reading every uh, part of this algorithm. So, the algorithm is there really for you to go back and read and use it for your implementation. But, but we have pretty much talked about this entire algorithm. Like, so if you read this, it's going to be a summary of like whatever we have discussed so far. Okay. So, so I will not talk about the algorithm uh, in detail, uh, but we can look at some examples. So in this case, this is a very simple grid world where the goal, you start wherever you want, but the goal is to reach this G grid, okay? Now, this illustrates how you can learn faster with n step, okay? Now, if you're doing one step SARSA, then you will make only this update. You're making only one step updates, okay? 
However, when you do n step sarsa, you can back up from all the way from here to here, which means instead of just doing one update, like you are kind of doing a lot of updates with just one interaction or one action, right? Like that is what this, all these action values are increased, not just the one step action value. On the other hand, like if you want to have similar effect with one step, you have to repeat the one step process n times so that this, this kind of propagates to the previous states, right? So this propagation happens much faster when you have n step, okay? However, like there's no free lunch, right? Like, so you cannot just keep on increasing the value of n and get better and better because at some point you're going to touch Monte Carlo and we know that Monte Carlo is not efficient, right? So, so it's, 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 there's a sweet spot in between and like often like you will try different values to find the sweet spot. Any questions? Any questions in the chat? Okay, so, but I think now I answered the previous question. Okay, so now I can talk about n step expected SARSA. Okay, it's really, now the discussion is really trivial. Like I'm just going to take the SAR, expected SARSA equation and update the target, okay? So it looks like we are seeing a lot of algorithms today, <coughs> okay? But as you can see, it is really one central equation. Like, so we are switching things here and there, like, and that gives us completely different algorithms. So what is, how does n-step expected SARSA look like, right? So in this case, you're going to have G, I will just talk about the update, okay? I will not talk about the equation. Like the equation is going to be very similar to SARSA. So GT to T plus N is going to be RT plus one plus a bunch of things. Plus gamma of N. If it is just SARSA, you have the value of the state at n time step, right? Now you're going to have an expected value. That's the only difference. So we are going to have V bar of T plus N minus one plus T plus N, okay? Now what is V bar? So V bar of a state is given by summation over all possible actions, pi of A given yes, Q T of S comma A. Is that clear? So it's just a very trivial extension of expected SARSA. Okay, so now we have seen on policy in step methods. So similarly, we can also talk about n step of policy learning. Okay. There are several n step off policy methods, okay. Uh, but just for our discussion, I took the simplest possible thing, which is basically using important sampling, okay. But you can construct, construct n step methods with Q learning and other things, okay. But what we are going to do today is just a simple version of n step TD, like which is going to use important sampling. Okay. Or in other words, I'm going to take an n-step SARSA kind of equation, okay? And just add an importance weight to it so that I can correct for the behavior policy. So Vt plus n of st is going to be Vt plus n minus one of st plus alpha times, if you remember our discussion about important sampling in Monte Carlo, right? So we will add this row of t to t plus n minus one multiplied by g t to t plus n minus v t plus n minus one. Okay, where this row of t to h is nothing but product of k is equal to t to the minimum of h comma t minus one because if the episode ends faster before that ends up then like you need to consider that. The probability according to the target policy divided by the probability according to the behavior policy. Okay. okay. Now, if, if both the policies are same, then rho is going to be one. So then you get the normal SARSA. But if you have a, if you decide to go with a separate behavior policy, then you can just correct the probabilities and you get an off policy algorithm for free. Okay, now this is how an off step, sorry, off policy 
n step sarsa would look like so it's going to be q t plus n of stat is equal to q t plus n minus 1 of stat okay plus alpha times you have a row function which is from t plus 1 to t plus n and then you have the g so n minus 1 of stat is that clear now this is the algorithm like so it's same as the n step sarsa except that you actually have uh, the row computed and incorporated properly okay again i encourage you to go back and read these algorithms in details okay so i think that concludes our discussion on td so i want to give a very quick summary so that uh, like because we have seen so many algorithms today okay so i'm going to give a quick summary but i highly encourage you to go back and spend time in reading the book reading the notes and get used to things okay so so far like so we have seen sorry so far we have seen dp monte carlo which i'm not going to talk about now so what we have seen today is td right so in the case of temporal difference learning like so we looked at td prediction problem and then we also looked at on policy td which is sarsa and off policy td which is q learning right so then we talked about the maximization bias maximization bias on how to solve that using double learning. right and we also found a way to integrate mc and td together like which is the idea of n step learning so now this is a new class of algorithm like td right so you have to do the whole process again so you have n step prediction you have on policy n step sarsa and you have off policy n step sarsa right now yeah question so, so something like uh, n step q learning should also help with the maximization bias right good question but the answer is no so would n step help with maximization bias why do you think n step is going to help with maximization bias because, because even after n step you are taking a max but the estimates are going to be better no so the maximization bias comes because of the arg max okay so that is not removed by n step learning okay so i think so far we have seen these three classes of methods for solving reinforcement learning okay we have one more class of method for solving reinforcement learning which is the idea of policy gradients okay however we are going to stop seeing new methods from next week okay so and we are going to focus on other problems that one might have to solve for solving reinforcement learning so there is one big problem which i always was hiding under these grid worlds which is it is all fine when you have 20 states 25 states like what happens if you have millions of states right so can you actually do these td learning or monte carlo methods easily like when you have millions of states like how to scale up these algorithms now that will take us to the idea of function approximation and how to learn from one state such that you can generalize to other states even without seeing them okay so that is going to be our focus for the next couple of weeks okay we are going to talk about function approximation okay so which is where we will bring in concepts from neural networks and deep learning so that we can design deep reinforcement learning algorithms okay so like so we are going to talk about function approximation um then we will talk about well then we will talk about, then we will go back to our idea of uh learning like solving reinforcement learning with other classes of problems like so uh and we will actually come back to n step methods once again like uh, in the future when i want to talk about when we are ready to talk about how to uh, seamlessly integrate many n steps in one step okay so uh, i think that concludes our 
lecture today. So I think now I'm on track to finish things uh, in one lecture. So hopefully uh, this is going to help us in the next few weeks. So, so now, if you have not spent time in revising things, which I can easily see from how I get answers from the class, okay? Only a subset of students answer. Like I really want all of you to answer. It is just going to get harder if you don't revise your concepts before the next week. So because so far we have developed very many classes of algorithms. Now we are not going to develop new algorithms in the next couple of weeks. So we are going to use these algorithms and just talk about other problems, okay? Which means you should know what is skew learning. You should know what is SARSA. You should know what is on policy of policy learning. So this is really a time for you to catch up with your reading if you have not um, read these things. There is also another incentive to read these things now. Like so, your second assignment will focus on Monte Carlo and TD. So they are going to implement some of these algorithms, which means you should also know them uh, very well. Okay, so please spend some time in reading. Uh, I really want more of you to answer the really basic questions that I'm asking. Here, okay, so that will also prepare you for the final exam. Um, okay, so this is my office hours. Well, officially, we will stop the class here. So this is my office hour. If you have anything about the project that you want to talk to me, you can actually do that. Thank you.